Okay, in this lesson we're going to take a look at parent functions and a collection of parent functions. So, what we're going to have to be able to answer by the end of the lesson is, well, what is a parent function? And what is the algorithm for changing the graph of a parent function? So, to put kind of in a nutshell, a parent function is going to be a basic set of functions, okay, uses building blocks for more complicated functions. And I'm going to introduce a bunch of parent functions in the, uh, the next slide and take a look at why they are. And then afterwards in the slides, we're going to go ahead and do graphical transformations of those functions. That means is that we can do a shift, stretch, rotation, or reflection, okay? And that is usually gonna be from a parent function. And then I'm also going to go ahead and show you how to um, do that from a non-parent function or just a, a graph function as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so these are the parent functions uh, that we're going to go ahead and be using in this particular section, okay? So a um, few different things is that we probably have um, seen these functions before from math too, okay? Um, however, uh, math three, we're going to go ahead and expand it to the ones that we haven't seen yet and get an idea of how they are formed and how to uh, how to use them, okay? So, um, in the next uh, couple short videos, we're just going to go ahead and take a look at each function, give it a name, and uh, parent function, give it a name, and then uh, show some points and how it's formed. Okay, uh, the first one is a quadratic function, and we know this guy as uh, a parabola. And um, it basically, uh, the parabola in standard form, we're going to get it by um, just using a t-chart of five clean points that are going to look like this. Okay, so just uh, plugging in uh, five quick points, a negative two through a two into the function itself, we're going to go ahead and get all of these output values and so therefore we're going to get uh, the points that we see the, on the graph in the left and this is how they correlate. Okay so when we uh, plot them all out like so uh, that's what it's going to look like and then we just have a smooth curve that's going to connect them all and that creates our parabola. Okay and we've seen that before and just a quick review on how we got it. So let's take a look at our next function. Okay, this next one is a cubic function, and the cubic function is um, kind of like the last function that we did, except it is raised to the third power, okay? And that's what it will look like. Um, it doesn't have really a specific name, even though a lot of people call it the squiggle, um, and I do as well, uh, but that's not the technical name for it, go figure. So here is the chart on how it is. Um, the five points are, are brought about. Okay, so again, taking the values uh, negative two through positive two and plugging them on into that function, uh, we're going to go ahead and get uh, those y values and this is how they correlate. And then a smooth curve is going to go ahead and go right through these guys like that. And that is our cubic function, or in some groups, the squiggle. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the next one. Okay, uh, the next parent function we're going to take a look at is the absolute value function. Okay. And um, just like uh, the cubic function, doesn't really have a name, but a lot of folks like to call it the V, um, if you will, which, you know, for obviously so. Um, and so um, it does come down to a point. This is not a polynomial function. So it has that pointed edge uh, right here, which makes it a non-polynomial function. And um, here is the table of values that uh, the five points are going to go ahead and correlate with. Okay, so once more, we plugged in a negative two through two into this function and got these outputs. And here's how they correlate to the graph. And then after when those uh, uh, points are plotted, we just go ahead and Again, making that sharp edge there, making it linear and different than a parabola like that, and uh, connect them up, and that's our absolute value function, okay? So, let's move on.
Okay, our next function is a square root function, and it looks like kind of like a wave, I suppose, I don't know, or like a, I, I don't know, someone throwing a ball that just keeps going up and up and up. Um, but at any rate, uh, what we're looking at is this business of um, the points that are going to be making up this thing. And remember, for a square root function, notice that it doesn't have any of the x's that are going to be negative because we know that we can't take the square root of a negative number. So we start at 0, 0, and we plug um, just some numbers in that are nice numbers to take the square root of so we can get some nice points for this business of our parent function. Okay, so that's how the values drop in. And remember that these are going to be the all-perfect squares. So these are, whoops, perfect squares. And again, the reason why we want those to be perfect squares, because when we do this step uh, to find the y values over here, then it's easy to do. We don't need a calculator, and we're looking for nice points to shift around that basically are integer values, okay? So let's see how the, uh, in color, how the points uh, correlate. Okay, so that's how they basically just keep going. So we start at zero, zero with a closed dot like this, okay? And then we just zap through these, and it just keeps going. So that's our square root function, and let's take a look at another root type function. Okay, so um, here is our cube root function, okay? And we notice that it's very similar to our square root function, okay? Um, when, and when I say that, uh, kind of like looking at just this portion right here, it looks like the square root function. However, since it's a cube root, and you can go ahead and take the cube root um, or any odd root of a negative number, it also adds on values that are for negative x's as well, okay? So let's take a look at the t-chart here and, uh, and see how these, uh, these numbers stack up. Okay, so there's uh, the chart there, and that is going to go ahead and again, just like the square root, okay, these are gonna be perfect cubes. And to show you why that works for the negatives, okay, and say if I have the cube root of a negative 8. So basically what this is, the answer to this is what number multiplied by itself three times is going to give us a negative 8. So a negative 2 makes sense because when I multiply it, and i got to put that negative sign there, we're going to have a flip-flop of the positive and negative signs. So a negative 2 times a negative 2 is 4. Bring down the negative 2. And then 4 times a negative 2, that's going to give me the negative 8. So it checks. So my solution would be a negative 2, which is the y output right there. And the same goes for the other ones um, that we chose. Again, we're looking at perfect cubes. Anything multiplied by itself three times uh, that is going to go ahead and be our x values, the nice ones to work with. So here's how the points stack up. Okay, it's like that guy. And again, we just go ahead and zap on through like this, okay? So um, those are our basic uh, functions that we're going to work with at the beginning. We're going to save the last one that was uh, right here, okay? Um, for uh, later on in the video because um, it has some rhyme or reason why it looks like it does. But for right now, let's go ahead and start graphing the, uh, the functions that we've discovered. Okay, so uh, a lot of information here. And what we're doing is that we are taking a parent function, okay, and we're going to be putting it on the graph below, okay? And then what we're going to do is that we're going to take a look at this right here, okay, which is going to give a set of instructions that are going to be found right here, okay, that are going to help us move that particular parent function around the graph or make it wider or narrower or flip it upside down or all this other good stuff, okay? So, um, let's do the parabola example first because uh, we're most familiar with it and then we'll move on uh, to the other ones. So, uh, here we go. 
the first step that we want to do when we're graphing is that we want to recognize and graph the parent function. So since this right here is a function that we're going to graph, notice that it has this square right here, okay? So that means is that that is going to uh, denote that that's going to be a parabola. So that is going to be a quadratic function. So we know that the quadratic function in its parent form is going to look like this. Okay, like that guy in the bottom left hand corner. So what I'm going to do is transfer all the points on over to the graph. Okay, and so our first step is going to look like that. All right, <clears throat> now our next step, next step is to go ahead and look at this multiplier here. Okay, so from here, we want to go ahead and take a look at the multiplier. And the multiplier, so it says apply the multiplier to the parent graph, is going to go ahead for the um, quadratic function is going to be a right here, and it is going to be a negative one half, okay? So I know applying the multiplier, that is a negative one half. So what does this tell us to do, okay? So we look over here and we got kind of two things going on. One is multiplied outside of the function, okay? So it's outside of the function itself. And so I'm going to go ahead and use this guy right here, okay? So as the parent graphs, y values are multiplied by this constant c, which is right in front. We also know that it's going to be negative, okay? And so the parent function is going to be reflected over the x-axis, which kind of takes care of itself if we do it correctly, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at all the points that are on this, uh, this parent graph here and multiply all the y values by the negative one-half. So let's start at uh, the leftmost uh, point that we have is that we have from the parent function a 2, negative 4. So what it tells us to do is that we're going to keep the x value the same, the negative 2. We take the original y value, which is 4, multiply it by the multiplier, a negative 1 half, right? And that is going to give us a new y value of a negative 2. And so we have 2, negative 2 as one of our new points. And what we do is that we do the same for the rest of the points. So taking the rest of the parent points like so, and then multiplying all the y values by a negative one half, like so, I'm going to get those new points and then I'm going to draw another dotted line through the parabola uh, to show that the second step is done. Okay. So our last step is to apply the shifts, okay? And so, oops, what we're going to do is that we're going to have to focus in on the this part right here uh, that we've seen before in Math 2, where we're going to be shifting the graph. And so, as we remember from last year, we might say we go opposite in this direction and true in this direction. But to go ahead and show it on the uh, set of notations over here, and again, we're on this step, is that we're going to go shift the whole graph, that is the, the pink one that we just went ahead and multiplied through by, and uh, shift it left C units, or in this case, three units, and then it is going to outside of the graph right here. We have the plus one, and that is going to go up that many units. And so at the end of the day, what we're looking at is the shift is going to go left three up one. So let's go ahead and take that pink graph and move it in real time here um, just to go ahead and show you what it will the way it would go. Okay. Now I know that you guys can't do this with pen and paper, but this is what it's looking like. We're left one two, three, and up one, okay? So that's what our final graph would look like. But let's go ahead and put all the graphs uh, all on the, uh, the same paper here so we can go ahead and show the steps. 
So every point that is red is going to move left three and then up one. Okay, and so that's what our final parabola is going to look like, okay? So it is uh, the one that is all in the green there, and it's kind of highlighting it out again, this guy. And that is our final step, okay? So again, to recap, we do the following, all right? We recognize the parent function. Then we go ahead and we do the multiplier. And then we're going to go ahead and shift the multiplied function according to the function notation. Okay, so let's take a look at another example moving forward. Okay, so this one, uh, kind of jumping right into it, is uh, let's just look at the steps. First of all, let's take a look at what we're going to be graphing, which is that guy. Okay, so first thing we've got to do is recognize and graph the parent function. It's a square root type of function because it has the radical sign right here. And so let's go ahead and uh, grab the, uh, the parent function. Okay, so we know that it's going to go ahead and look like this. And we're going to have some points that are going to be x's are perfect squares. Uh oh, look like we're cut off a little tiny bit, so we'll put the 9 over here. And then this is where we start. So we have our square root function set up. Okay. So next step, we find the multiplier. Okay. And the multiplier is right in front here. So that is going to go ahead and multiply all the y values, uh, or I'm sorry, um, all, yeah, all the y values by 2. So that means is that each one of those, just like in the previous example, all the y values are going to get multiplied by 2. And so each one of those original uh, points from the parent function are going to pop up like that. And then we're going to just make a dotted line through there so we can see um, this, the steps and where we were going with this. And then finally, we're going to look at the... Um, the shifting okay and the shifting is going to be inside the function so we're going and we got a plus so we're going to be moving left c unit so left one unit and then we're going to be moving the whole thing down four units as well and so let me fill in the other parts uh, while i have that here looks like i forgot to do that so the multiplier is a two and the shift is going to be left one down four. So um, let's go ahead and shift the pink graph, all those points left one and down four and see where we land. Okay, so that's what our final graph is going to look like. Remember when we're graphing the uh, the square root functions is at the point that it's, we start off with, okay, and way back here from the parent function has to be a filled in dot. So let's, let's not, um, you know, get sloppy or anything like that. Make sure that we put a nice point there and then we start drawing our graph from it. Okay, so on to the next example. All right, this one is an absolute value function. Okay, and we can see that by looking at this guy down below. And again, we're recognizing the function and we got the absolute value bars, if you will, the notation. And so we know that we are going to be doing an absolute value parent function. That's going to look like this. Okay, so putting all the points on there real nicely so we can start. Okay, so there are points, and then draw some lines through. And that's where we start off. Okay, so let's go ahead and grab the multiplier. And the multiplier looks like it's going to be a negative 3. Um, and so for negative 3, let's um, multiply each one of, again, using this each one of the y values uh, by 3. And remember, it's negative, so it's going to be reflected over the y-axis. But if you're multiplying in the negative, it's going to happen anyhow. So you're going to get negative values for your y. And so that said, um, let's see how those turn out. Okay, and so there it is. And it definitely flipped it up over the y-axis, and it got a uh, little bit uh, thinner than the, uh, the parent function there. 
And then finally, um, let's take a look at the shift. So applying the shift, um, it looks like we're going to have, we're going to go right for, okay, because uh, we're going the opposite direction. So we got this going right four units and up one. So up that many units. And so let's get that. So we go right four and up one. And so the whole thing is going to go, the um, graph that is in red is going to go ahead and go right four and up one. So it's going to look like this. And there it is. Okay, so that's our our final um, shifted and multiplied around uh, absolute value function. Okay, so uh, let's move on to another example that you're going to kickstart yourself. Okay, so here is one that we are you're going to kickstart yourself. And so take a moment and see if you can recognize and graph the parent function. Okay, you'd be correct if you had a cube root function all ready to go. Okay, and um, from there, let's go ahead and see if you can recognize the multiplier. Okay, you'd be correct if you found out that the multiplier was a 3 and it multiplied all the y values by um, 3, uh, all the parent y values by 3. Okay, and we got to look kind of closely here. What is going to be the shift? All right, the shift tells us to just go up one. Notice that there is nothing inside the actual function of the square root, so it's not moving left or right any, but it is moving up one. So the only rule that can be applied is the one where the graph is being shifted up one, okay? So that's the general idea on how we will go ahead and uh, graph our functions uh, using a parent multiplier shift method. And so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a new type of function for Math 3 here. Okay, this uh, next function might be better served with a little story. So um, let's go ahead and uh, line it up. Okay, so say we have a hamster that wants um, some hamster treats. And our hamster goes ahead and runs across the dollar store and they sell yummy hamster treats inside. So that said, is that the hamster starts to ask certain people passing by for some change to go ahead and get something from the dollar store, okay? Because the hamster didn't bring any money, didn't know the dollar store was in the neighborhood, and didn't know they were selling treats, so kind of caught off guard. That said, the first person that the hamster asks gives the hamster a quarter. Okay, so the hamster now has a quarter in their little fuzzy pocket. So how many items, if everything is a dollar in the dollar store, just pretend, I know that the dollar store can sell some stuff cheaper and whatnot, but if everything is exactly a dollar in the dollar store, how many things can the hamster buy? Okay, so the answer would be zero, right? Because they don't have enough money. So say if another person goes ahead and comes by and gives them, let's see, uh, 50 cents. So let's see how many items that the hamster could buy. Okay, so though the hamster does have some money, 75 cents, that still can't buy anything because it needs exactly $1 and there's no tax or anything like that in Hamsterville here. So, And it's not until the hamster gets the additional quarter that they have a whole unit of one dollar that is going to allow them to get a delicious treat. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep that story in mind and let's apply it to the greatest integer function up top. Okay, the greatest integer function basically means is that anytime that we have a value that is going to be in between numbers like say one quarter like a like that it's like having no money to spend at the dollar store and likewise even if you added the 50 cents to it you would go back to zero until you popped all the way up into one dollar and then you would have then you can stay there and you could buy exactly one item 
And so even if the hamster continued to buy uh, to um, ask for money and say it had a dollar fifty, right? They could only buy one item from the dollar store because they only have enough for one dollar with fifty cents left over, which isn't enough to go ahead and get you to the next item. So that said, that's the way that the greatest integer function will work. Let's go ahead and plug in the values from the dollar store example to uh, see how this works. So first the hamster started off with zero. And so the greatest integer function evaluated at zero is going to give me zero. Then the hamster had a quarter of a dollar. The greatest integer of quarter of a dollar is zero still, can't buy anything. Then the 75 cents, greatest integer of 0.75 is still zero. Until we get to one in which we have, the greatest integer of one is one. And then say we got 50 cents more, the greatest integer is of 1.5. All right, let's make it into money there, add a zero there, and that is going to give me one still. So basically, we're always going back until we reach the next integer. We have to go ahead, and if we fall in between the integers, we have to go back to the left for one. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and put this into play. When we're graphing these out, I'm going to go ahead and just quickly show you the uh, the points on the graph as it correlates. Again, these are not going to be um, the, the points for the parent graphs exactly, but just to show you the way that it would line up. Okay, so there's the color coordinated points uh, that would fall on this business of the greatest integer function. And notice um, some things here. Again, like say if this were again, the hamster had, this is money, right? And this is going to go ahead and be the number of treats that are a dollar each, okay? Is that notice that this is an open dot right here. It's no longer, well, let's back up a little bit. Is that all of these amounts of change right here still get the hamster zero treats. It's not until they get the dollar that it pops up to the next, if you will, um, uh, line segment there and notice that this has to go ahead and be an open dot and this is going to be a closed dot with all of these left hand bars here okay and so as soon as a hamster gets two dollars then they can go up to get two items and as soon as they get three dollars they can go up to get three items and etc okay so that's the way that the greatest integer function works. And uh, let's take a look at um, the different ways that we got to go ahead and uh, shift in around this, uh, this, this new thing that we have. Okay, so let's take a look at um, shifting around the graph of this, uh, this new greatest integer function that we have. So let's start going through all the steps. Okay, so here is the computer generated version. And so we're just going to transfer it onto our graph um, the following ways. Okay, so there it is in its parent form. And again, notice, make sure that this is a closed dot and it ends with an open dot. Very, very important. Okay. So what we're basically looking at is that we're checking for multipliers, but they're not quite, they, they work in a different way. So we're going to do the multipliers in the next um, two examples here. But what we're looking at is this right here, okay? It's inside the function, so we know that it's going to go opposite horizontally in that amount. So it says a negative four. So it means is that I'm going to go right four, and then this is outside the function, and that is going to go ahead and give me a negative one, which is going to give, go down one. So the whole, all of these um, bars, if you will, are going to go ahead and go 
right four, and then down one. What I usually do is that I take one of them and then I just take the pattern from there. So I just go one, two, three, four, and down one, okay? And then I just continue the pattern from that particular bar all set up. So um, it seems to work easiest and uh, this is what it's gonna look like. Okay. So there it is, uh, shifted on over. And if you're not certain where those uh, the shifting came from, remember it's just, it was on this page right here, uh, just drawn from this notation, okay? So let's go ahead and move on to the next one that has a multiplier and it's gonna work out a little bit differently. So let's, uh, let's check that out. Okay, so what I wanna do for um, explaining what happens when we have a multiplier inside the greatest integer function is take a look at the parent function, which is this guy right here, and the graph of this function that's done by Desmos, and just so we can compare the two, so we're able to go ahead and predict what these other graphs or with multipliers are gonna look like. Okay, so there is the graph done out uh, by a computer, it came out light, so I just highlighted it in uh, purple there. But anyhow, what we're looking at is that notice that, um, let's just start putting the pieces together, okay? Is that notice that in its parent form, all of these bars are going to go ahead and be the unit length of one. But when I add a two inside the greatest integer function, like so, notice that they all end up getting cut in half, okay? So now they are all just a half unit in length. So basically what we're looking at is the following, okay? Is that it is fair to say that one of the ways that I always recommend students think about it is that we go ahead and we ha we put the regular function on the graph to start off with, or when I say the regular function, the parent function. Okay, like that guy, and it keeps going. And what I do is that um, it looks like I'm going to take whatever number that is inside, okay, that is multiplying by the, uh, being multiplied by the x, I take that, and I take the original length of that and I go of the um, line segments and I cut it or I divide it by that amount too, okay? And so that is going to give me the new length, which is going to be 0 0.5, which is what we got right here going from this to this. So the way that I do that is that I just start by shortening the first one and continuing the pattern from there. Okay, just like that guy. And kind of just keep with the same, oops, keep with the same pattern until we run out of room. And etc. okay, and it goes on that direction. So the rule of thumb is that if we have a multiplier inside of the greatest integer function, each length of the greatest integer segments are one divided by C long, okay? So that's how you go ahead and do something that is inside and let's go ahead and take a look at something that is outside. Okay, so notice now that we have uh, the greatest integer function and we have a multiplier outside. So let's do the same thing that we did in the last um, example and compare two graphs generated by a generated by Desmos. Okay, so what we're looking at, the difference between the two, okay, where we have the parent function up top in blue and the function that we're trying to graph, we're trying to figure out the steps of graph, uh, in green and comparing them out. So one of the things that we notice is the following, is that all of the lengths, oops, all of the lengths of the, um, the line segments or bars are going to go ahead and be all the same. They're all gonna be ones, okay? So 
the length is going to be one straight across the board. So that doesn't change whatsoever. But what does change is going to go ahead and be the difference between the vertical difference between the bars. Like for example, this is one, one, one. So all of these distances right here are going to be one, but these are two. These are all doubled up, okay? And so we can go ahead and say that this guy right here is going to change the vertical distance between each one of the line segments, okay? So let's look at how we would graph this. Let's start with just a parent graph like that guy. And I pick the one, I always kind of, I always start in the middle right here. And then I recognize that the distance, since this is a multiplier of two again, it's going to pop up two spaces before I repeat the same unit length of one bar. And this is going to pop up two more, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just continue with that pattern until we are out of room and we have successfully graphed this guy. So to put in a nutshell, anytime that we have a multiplier that is outside the greatest integer function, we know is that the vertical distance between segments, oops, is C. Okay, and so um, that's how you go ahead and do that. And we're gonna be practicing uh, some of these guys, putting uh, the pieces together uh, with them. And uh, yeah, we'll see where that takes us. So um, on to our last part, which is going to go ahead and be a function that doesn't have really a, um, a formula to it, but we're still going to go ahead and be moving it around. So uh, see you in the next part. Okay, in these examples, what we're looking at is we have f of x that is going to go ahead and just be this graph right here, okay? And it's gonna be the same for each one of these. What we're gonna do is that we don't really have um, all of these rules right here that uh, to apply to a said um, actual function equation, but we do have the function notate. We have a, a picture of the function or a graph of the function, and then we also have this business of the function notation. So let's go ahead and piece together uh, what we we need to do. Okay. So the first thing that we want to do is recognize and graph the parent function. Well, that's already done for us. Okay. So that is the graph uh, that's down below. It looks like a crookedy M. And then what we want to do is that we want to apply the multiplier to the parent graph. Okay. Now the multiplier is going to be out front like this guy. And we know that when it's out front, it says the parent graph is reflected over the X axis. So to do so, what we're going to do is that we're going to reflect over the X axis by discounting the spaces that it takes for each little the the point or the vertex or um, you know the pointy parts of the graph or the endpoints and um, count how many spaces to the x-axis and then count beyond so watch this one two so it goes one two and that's our new point one and one that's our new point ah it's not let me know. so one two three one two three and that's our new point one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And that's our new point. And one, and one, and that is our new point. So after we go ahead and connect them all up, and I'm going to get rid of the little counting spaces, it's going to look like this. Okay, so there we are. So looking at this, um, what are we going to go ahead and do next? is that it appears we have this business of stuff happening inside and being um, subtracted inside the function and outside. So we know that this rule is going to apply right here. We're going to go right to units. Okay, so right to units. And then, uh, and then I'm going to go up one. And so that is the part that's back here okay so that's going to go up one 
And so, right to up one. And so each one of those points, um, we're going to do shift it around and go right to up one, right to up one. Again, we're using the nice points. All right, and then connect them up. And the green graph is going to be our final graph, okay? So um, sometimes it gets pretty busy and you might want to go ahead and erase some, uh, some steps and whatnot um, after you get them done, especially if there's a lot to do. But this shows process and uh, especially if you color coordinate them and whatnot. Oops, I forgot to color coordinate that in green. And it kind of like shows uh, your work and understanding, which is uh, what I'm after. Okay, so let's take another look at, or let's take a, another example here and uh, take a look at what else could happen. Okay, so here we go with the next one, and I'm going to change this one up a little tiny bit. Um, so look down below here um, at the very, very bottom right, um, or I'm sorry, the well, the bottom right of this video. I want to change this into a 2x, uh, just a quality of life thing. I think it's going to be a little bit nicer, okay? So what we want to do is that we want to, um, all right, very simple. Recognize the graph and the parent function. So it's already given to us, so we're all set. And it says apply the multiplier. So the multiplier this time is going to be inside. Okay. And so we're going to be dividing the x values by c, um, it says, because you notice that the 2, just like this guy right here, okay, the multiplier is on the inside of the function, and so is this 2 down here. So what I want to do is take all the x values and divide them up by 2, okay? So notice, and I'm going to just list all the x values off to the left-hand side here, divide them all by 2, and then we'll graph them. So um, here we go. Okay, so this is one of the easier ways to, to do this out, is that we go ahead, and when we're dividing each one of the x values by 2, we're going to get new points, and then we can put those on the graph. So, dividing these all by 2, um, these are the new points that we get. Okay, so the blue dot is going to go from negative 4, negative 2 to negative 2, negative 2. Okay, and the red one is going to go negative 1, negative 1. The green one's going to stay at the exact same spot because 0 divided by 2 is a 0. Uh, 2 divided by 1, and the next one is going to pop it on over to 1. And then this is going to give me a 1.5 over here. And then I connect them all up like so. And that is going to go ahead and be my new graph, even though it's kind of hard to see. So the graph itself is this guy. Oops. The graph itself is this guy right here. Okay, that would be our final graph. And so we can see that it kind of... Um, if it were an accordion, it kind of like uh, smooshed it a little tiny bit uh, there. So that's how you go ahead and deal with something that's inside of the parentheses. And let's take a last example look here at uh, another something that could happen. Okay, so um, what I want you to do is go ahead and take a look at all the, uh, the steps here. So again, recognizing uh, the graph already given to us and whatnot. So what I want you to do is um, take a look at the multiplier and match it up and see if you can uh, predict what the first step is going to look like. So uh, go ahead and uh, do it out and then check your work first mine. Okay, so what it tells us to do, since the multiplier is outside of the function, what we want to do is take all of the, it looks like the y values, and multiply them by one half. So that's going to give us new points that are going to look like. Okay, so it's going to go ahead and take a look uh, at that gray graph right there, okay? Now, the last thing that it tells us to do, okay, after we went ahead and we applied the multiplier, is that now we have to do any of the shifting. And so, make a prediction what you think that the shift is going to go ahead and do. Okay, if you predicted that the gray graph was going to go ahead and get shifted up three units, you are correct, okay? So the final graph is going to be the one in green, okay? So um, 
and uh, just doing out all of the steps. Again, we don't need to actually see the function equation. Uh, we can apply the function notation to a graph of the function if it is given. So uh, that's going to conclude the video, and um, you'll get some practice that I hope that will go very well for you. And um, yeah, I will see you in the next lesson.